On the last episode, we uncovered the unique and ancient genetic lineage of the Neosho bass. If you haven't listened to part one, you're going to want to go back now and do that. On part two of our series, we're going to be talking about what has taken place in the scientific community and what has happened since the all-important 2022 paper established the Neosho bass as Micropterus velox. It's a long story. We haven't even started to touch the historical, cultural, ecological, and managerial implications for this fish yet. We are still deep in the scientific weeds. The weeds, however, are necessary for the rest of this series. We start this episode talking about the scientific process and the impact of this research in the rewriting of the 2024 American Fishery Society official freshwater book. This book is widely considered the Bible of fish names and species. This episode answers the burning question we've all been asking since the very start of this project. So to say it in plain English, is a Neosho bass a smallmouth? So in 2024, then beginning of this year, mm-hmm. what was the like official final finding? Yeah, so uh, yeah, that's a, that's also a difficult question because as a <laughs> scientist, I just I don't really uh, I, we get to a point where we feel sure enough about a body of work that we can go to publish it. Mm-hmm. Uh, we go through a process of peer review, or uh, many times it's anonymous, where other experts in the field weigh in okay. and make sure the the results are valid and they're going to hold water. Okay. Right? So that started happening after 2022. That no, that, that was actually well before. So that oh, okay. paper went through that whole process. Okay. And we got some really good feedback, you know, like you always do. You you know, people have different opinions and people want to see different things to to validate and justify and check, mm-hmm. right? And that's what that's what's so valuable about that scientific process is you're getting different sets of eyes on it. People who are coming with different approaches, different backgrounds. Mm-hmm. And and you want to make sure like when that gets published, it's going to stand the test of time, right? right? Uh, We can always change our mind. We can always, like, build on those hypotheses. We can always go back and say, you know what, maybe we got to reframe things, right? That's that's science. That's the scientific process. But for me, it's like that body of work continues. So I don't know that we're at, like, a final point. Mm -hmm. But what I will say, though, is after that paper came out, that 2022 paper, it was a round of, it was kind of a convenient timeline. Uh, because within our uh, group of people who are fish nerds and professionals that work on fish, mm-hmm. whether we manage them, whether we study them as like ichthyologists, whether we study their evolution, whatever, right? We come together and one of our big bodies is the American Fishery Society. That we call it AFS. And they have a sort of, was it a standing committee? Mm-hmm. And it's joint with another uh, society, the the Society of Ichthyologists and Herpetologists. Okay. Yes. ASI. Ix and Herps. Yeah, Ix and Herps. Okay. Yeah. And they get together every so often, and it's not very regular. Um, and they take the entire body of work, and they curate a book called the the Names and Fishes yep. book. Yep. The Common, Common and Scientific, scientific names, names of Freshwater Fishes. That's it. Got it. Okay. <laughs> and, I mean, that's basically setting the tone for, like, these are the accepted conventions right. within our field— of what we're going to call things. So if there's any disagreement, go to the book. This is the book, right. I mean, it's a huge undertaking. Okay. And it's a lot of, like, experts in their field, right? And so that body, of course, had heard about our paper because black bass are Mm -hmm. something a lot of people care about. Lots of eyes on black bass. And there was a lot of splash there because we're like, oh, well, we're kind of changing some names around. We're kind of finding some new things, right? Um so basically, they looked at that body of evidence, and they're like, "Yeah, that plus all the previous work that's been done by all these different entities is enough to accept all the names as they were proposed in that paper into the formal common and scientific names of fishes." So wow. if you go and you look at black bass, which I have, because I was like, I just have to see this for Gotta myself, because right? I'm also like. <laughs> A fanboy yeah. of the black bass world myself, yeah. right? Yeah, you're an angler. And so I'm like, I want to see this in print. And yeah, there it is, like my Cropterus velox, 
Neosho, Neosho bass. bass. Man. So it now holds ground with largemouth bass, smallmouth bass, spotted bass. There's Neosho bass. Yep. It's its thing. It's its own thing. So yeah. to say it in plain English, heard it here first, out of the doctor's mouth or mouths, is a Neosho bass a smallmouth? <laughs> <laughs> That's a tough oh, question. Man. <laughs> okay. It's it's not my Cropter's Dolomew. So it's not it's not a small mouth. It's not a small, it's mouth. Not a small, not a small mouth. mouth. Yeah. That's what I was looking for. It is in the lineage I, I, of small mouths. Exactly. It's so it's I don't know. There's and it's so messy. much nuance. And it's blurred You're lines. asking a fish scientist. To, oh, <laughs> there's I know. So, just so that much nuance. through the complexity. That's it is why not I said a small common, mouth bass. Common English. Common like for the average angler. <laughs> We've been and, calling it a complex of species. Okay. Yeah. I a like small mouth complex. So like this kind of started around the time that we said red eye bass uh-huh. across its range. It's, it's it's basically kind of like these Neosho bass, Wachita bass, they're, they're in the uplands. And then once the river turns big and muddy and sandy and hot, they don't really live there. Mm-hmm. So they're isolating these pockets in the, in basically in the hill country of like North Alabama, North mm-hmm. Georgia, uh, South Carolina. Um, they're very isolated. Are they all different? Mm-hmm. And so when we started to split those a- apart, people were like, well, they're red eye bass but they're also their own unique thing, so mm. it's a species complex. Right. They all descended from one ancestor that was red-eye bass-like. Mm-hmm. It had probably that mm-hmm. kind of base appearance of what you would think a red-eye bass would look like, yeah. but they've kind of all diverged into their own paths and their own looks and their own ecologies. Yeah. Right. So you'd so, be saying... So that it's a species complex. Yeah. Right. But I would then, it, you know, I mean, I would reiterate that a Neosho bass is a Neosho bass. It's its own thing. Right. It... We don't think they live as long as smallmouth. We don't think they get as big as smallmouth. They may not get as abundant as smallmouth. Yeah. In places where smallmouth have been stocked in Neosho bass territory, smallmouth get big. Mm-hmm. So it has never been about habitat. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Neosho bass are not smallmouth. Every, every time we've tried to apply a, a smallmouth lens to Neosho, we keep thinking, why are these, why are these smallmouth small? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, now the lens is... They're a Neosho bass, mm-hmm. and they are small. We shouldn't expect them to get as big as the yeah. Ab- smallmouth. Right. So it's Absolutely. a common ancestor it's of like a move your goal small post, mouth right? type fish. Yes. It's a- the, the, the high, you know, from a long time ago. What you would expect to catch for a smallmouth bass in the Great Lakes, you're not going to catch in an Ozark stream where Neosho bass live. Yeah. Right. It's a totally different environment. Or here environment. in Arkansas, right. if right. you go to the Buffalo, they have smallmouth. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You're going to catch 18, 20-inch smallmouth in right. the Buffalo. But you go right across the ridge to the big piney or the mulberry where we were just at. Mm-hmm. You're going to catch a Neosho bass. And if you catch a 14-incher, that's a prize. Yeah. yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Which I think is so, so important mm-hmm. to the common angler to understand of like, okay, imagine a world where if all we cared about was catching big fish, like you would just target the, you would want the smallmouth to be everywhere, right? Like you would say, oh, well, you know what? The Neosho, we don't care about the the endemic species, blah, blah, blah. And you'd kind of just throw that to the wind. You'd say, let's put smallmouth in every stream so they can get as big as possible. But I think it's important to to know that just because the Neosho doesn't get as big, it's the same prize and trophy to catch, like you're saying, a 14-inch as you're catching a 14-inch Neosho as if you're catching an 18-inch plus smallmouth right. bass. Mm-hmm. And so to have that expectation and know that going into it, it's like that's not to be looked down upon right. with a 14-inch Neosho. Right. That's actually mm-hmm. to be celebrated as, like, we're the only place in the world that has a Neosho bass. Mm-hmm. Those guys up in Michigan that love their smallmouth fishing, good for them. That's not the same fish. No. They don't have this fish. Right. Yeah, I tend to think about it this way, too, especially now that I've done more schooling and kind of thought more about, like, the history of these critters. Like, I've always thought it's been really special to me to, like, like as an angler, I love going into kind of uncharted territories to get into their, like, native habitats Mm -hmm. and see the native fish. They're the master of their environment. But think about this, too. Neosho bass have been doing their own thing from all the other smallmouth bass for a million years or more. Mm -hmm. They are the masters of their environment. They have a, a million years or more of dealing with the many, many droughts the many, many floods, right? They've persisted. If you take 
some other critter from some other habitat and introduce them, you may get a boom for a few years. Fishing may be great. Mm -hmm. Long term, can they live there? How are they going to do? Yeah. Right? It's, we, a, it's an experiment. <laughs> yeah. it, you basically created an experiment that you don't know the outcome of. Mm -hmm. But many, many times we've seen it's not going to turn out good. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you, you know, you like when you're there in their native habitat, you've got basically you're witnessing the product of like the Earth's history. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. All the all the challenges that those fish have gone through to be there where they are today. Mm -hmm. And I think there's something special to that. Yeah. It's just not something that I think most people think about when they're going out on a fishing trip. Right. Yeah. People go out for the size. It's, 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 it's kind of just like we need a little bit of a shift in mindset towards appreciating each type for its unique growth right. potential. Right. And so we've had a paper c come out just recently um, that I worked with the International Game and Fish Association, the IGFA, Oh, wait, no, it's International Game Fish Association. Mm. Sorry, International Game Fish Association. So they're like the world record keepers that most people acknowledge. Like, they keep the most legitimate world records for all fish, fresh saltwater. And, you know, with all this coming out, the, the 2022 paper showing um, these are real legitimate differences, and then the AFS names the fishes committee saying, like, yep, we're accepting those names. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well... If you look at their record keeping, it was very much lagging. Mm -hmm. They had not made a lot of these adjustments because the world of black bass had changed a lot in the last mm -hmm. 20 years. Uh, a ton. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, we went from having, what, like seven or eight seven. species yeah. to like 19. 19. Wow. <laughs> right? Yeah, that's a lot. And so if you're outside that world, you don't even know how to deal with that, <laughs> yeah. right? And so it was not a fault of IGFA. And in fact, once I kind of approached them, they were like, well, you're the expert. Let's work together. Let's yeah, fix it. We want cool. it to be we want it to be right. Mm -hmm. Right. And so they have kind of acknowledged like, yeah. So like things like spotted bass and Alabama bass. We've acknowledged those are now different species. They have different growth potentials. Beautiful thing is, they've done that now for Neosho bass. Mm. So there is now a, a vacant record sitting right now for Neosho bass. No way. <laughs> I know what I'm doing for the rest of the summer. Because <laughs> they're not a smallmouth bass. <laughs> yeah. right. You're not going to catch an eight-pound Neosho bass. Yeah. Like, I hate to break it to you if you're yeah. thinking you are, but, like, yeah. I mean, their growth potential, like, a two-pound Neosho bass would be, like, an absolute It would be a world record. Monster. <laughs> it would be a world record. <laughs> yeah. It would, it would be the first. That's, uh, wow. I was turkey hunting this spring, and I I came across a little creek, and I, I bent down as I was about to cross it to get into this kind of open timber area. And I found a really, really pristine arrowhead. So I pick it up and I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, I'm standing in, in the exact spot that a native, probably an Osage native, I don't know, 100, 200 years before me has stood and he was mm -hmm. hunting game. Mm -hmm. And um, I love applying even that level of thinking when I'm going after fish in a small stream, especially when you're saying these are the oldest, these are the first, these are different. You know, you're you're targeting a Neosho bass in the Ozarks. You are targeting the same fish that the native peoples before us for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years relied on and ate mm -hmm. and interacted with. And it's I mean, it's just so cool knowing that it was here, it's been here, it's been isolated, it's its own thing. And genetically, for the ones that aren't hybridizing, and we're gonna need to talk about that, like the the strains that are more pure. Those are the same fish. So the Neosho is different. The Dolomew, the smallmouth bass, mm -hmm. is that native to Arkansas as well? Or was that only brought and introduced through those historical stockings? That's a good question. It, it's native. It is native to it's Arkansas native. as well. Okay. So it's actually also in the Ozarks. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you can't just... It's... <laughs> It's kind of hard to wrap your mind around. You can't just be in the Ozarks yeah. because you have to think more in terms of where does the water drain, Right. okay? Mm -hmm. So you have to think more about watersheds and, and what side of the mountain you're on or mm -hmm. what side of the ridge you're on. So if the water's draining into the Arkansas River Basin, uh, off directly off the Ozarks, mm -hmm. you're in Neosho Bass Range. Okay. But there's a lot of the Ozarks that drains more directly eastward or south and eastward. Into the White River. White River. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, White River Basin. I'm trying to think if there's 
others in Arkansas. So maybe the Black River? Yeah, coming down from like northeast. Yep. yep. Arkansas. Those are all going to be native smallmouth bass, my crop yep. first Okay. Got yep. it. I think that's important to know too because it's we're not just saying that only the Neoshos would have been in the Ozarks. Mm -hmm. Just kind of a side note that all four are in Arkansas. That says a lot about the the biodiversity of, of Arkansas in general uh, and this, this region that you have those differences where these lineages were isolated for so many years that they ultimately kind of became different species, mm -hmm. if I'm understanding evolution. Yeah, yeah that's right. Correctly. Yeah. Um, but that's just cool in itself. But it's, it's, there's a place for everything, right? We're not saying that the Neo Show should be everywhere and that it belongs everywhere. It is a symbol of the Ozarks. I think culturally, historically, for, for anglers, um, it's something that we can be proud of. Say, this is native. This is kind of like, it's just like me. I was born here, raised here. Mm -hmm. I can like be represented by and within this fish. Mm -hmm. um, and that's important. We have like our cultural heritage. We have like, this is like a natural heritage. Exactly. I love thinking about it in that term. Like where I grew up, it's red eye bass. That's yeah. That's part of my natural heritage. Right. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So for someone listening and say, okay, got it. Neo shows its own thing. Small mouth is something different. What's the significance and what does this mean going forward? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, names are really important. Mm -hmm. Name is kind of the first step in recognizing, like, we, we believe these things are different and we should treat them as such. Mm -hmm. So this whole time we have this legacy of, well, they're just kind of a subtype or a specialty local variety of smallmouth bass. Okay, well how much of smallmouth bass really applies. Maybe maybe not that much, right? Mm -hmm. And so one of the other studies that we haven't really talked about yet, um, Jim and I kind of teamed up for this study, um, and I had a master's student named Kobe White who did his uh, master's thesis on this topic, and it was basically like, well, we have the genetic tools to tell them apart. Mm -hmm. We know where they co-occur. We, we have native Neosho bass, and we have stocked smallmouth bass, they're in the same streams at the same time, at the same place. Let's use genetics and look at their actual, like, ecology and growth history, mm -hmm. their life history. Yeah. So how big do they get? At mm -hmm. what sizes? Mm -hmm. At what ages? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and where do you know, they live? if you go completely blind, you start to build this, what we call, like, a growth curve where you've got, like, um, age would be, like, your horizontal axis, your x-axis, mm -hmm. and length would be your vertical axis, your y-axis. Yeah. So you kind of get like, usually with fish, you, you grow really early, uh, really fast early in life through a, at least the first couple of years because you want to get bigger than things that could eat you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you get to that size where, okay, now I'm big enough, I can put some of my, my uh, energy into reproduction. Mm -hmm. And so that growth starts to really taper off. Mm -hmm. And fish, they grow their entire life. They slow down a lot, mm -hmm. but we all know as anglers, there's a big difference in size between a 20-inch fish and a 21-inch fish, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. A huge difference yeah. in the potential weight of that fish, right? Right. So growth really slows up at older ages. So we have this, uh, we took all these fish where they co-occur. How many did you they, catch? Like, and were you angling? Are you going out and electroshocking oh. or... It was a combination of all kinds of different efforts. Because okay. let's be real, we all know this as fishermen. Some places are really hard to get to. Yeah. Some of the places these fish live are really, really hard to get to. So ideally, one of the easiest methods we have, or most efficient methods, I should say, is what we call boat electrofishing. Right. So we have like a generator mounted on a boat, and we put electricity in the water, temporarily stuns them, they float to the surface, we net the ones we want to study, work them up. Mm-hmm. Um, but we couldn't always get, you, you can imagine through the Ozarks, you can't always get a boat, uh, hardly, No, you know, so we're, Especially we're, in these shallow, we're skinny sometimes, streams. Yep. sometimes we can put a uh, electrofishing unit on our back. We call it a backpack shocker. Kind of looks like a Ghostbuster You're a type ghost situation. Buster. <laughs> um, but it's basically like a lawnmower battery on your back and you control where you put the current into the water and you wear these like really thick insulated rubber waders, which is like... So you don't get shocked. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, you know, that's that part's comfortable, but that's the only thing that's comfortable uh -huh. about it because it's usually we're out in, you know, the heat of the summer, like yeah. cooking ourselves alive sure. as we do this. Uh, and it's really hard. So there are places where, yeah, we had to like supplement with angling because it's literally like... Otherwise, it's it's a dangerous situation to try to do it with other things. Yeah. Um. So yeah, we got like hundreds. Yeah. 
and like I, a big I think sample I size. Read, I read I read Kobe's thesis um, cover to cover, and, and it's probably the first time I've ever read a true scientific thesis. So I was like working my way through it, like okay, I don't know what that word means. Got to Google it. It's like every other sentence or paragraph. Um, but I remember seeing. I think t- correct me if I'm wrong. Twelve hundred to fifteen hundred different samples were collected across all of the different efforts that maybe took place over a year or two? It was a couple of years. Okay. Yeah, it was a couple of years. It was a huge effort. It was, you know, University of Central Oklahoma, but we couldn't have done anything without the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation. Mm-hmm. They were interested in that question. They bought into, okay, let's do this line of work, mm-hmm. right? And um, so so they helped a great deal with, like, the the collection component, like getting people out in the field to get those samples we needed. Um, but yeah, we we amassed a huge collection, and the thing is, like, we're looking at growth. We're like, okay, well, there's huge variation. Like, we start off with age two fish that can be like many, many inches different in length. Okay, so then it's like, well, now let's apply our genetics and see if that parses any of this variation out. Mm-hmm. And it did, like, big time. So all of our biggest, oldest fish are pure smallmouth. Mm-hmm. All of our smaller end of the growth spectrum were Neosho. Yeah. And, of course, they hybridize with each other. In this case, you never really know what to expect with how the hybrids are going to do. In this case, they kind of almost just went intermediate. They have intermediate Hmm. growth. Okay. Noted, though, they don't get that top end size of a pure smallmouth. Okay. So where you have a hybrid zone... You know, you may not be getting that top end growth right. for a pure smallmouth. Yeah. For Neosho bass, on the other hand, well, the other thing that was super shocking that came to light was we aged all those fish. We estimated the age of each fish. Typically, smallmouth bass, just generally, you know, as we have applied smallmouth bass as part of what Neosho bass probably could be doing, they grow to about 10 years old, mm-hmm. like fairly commonly documented, even, even in, uh, Parts of the Ozarks, I think. Mm -hmm. So we were kind of expecting like that would be an average life expectancy for these fish. Mm -hmm. And the oldest Neosho out of all those samples, we're talking hundreds and hundreds of samples across several different streams, five, five years old. Really? Wow. Yeah. That was the oldest Neosho that you guys And in that same system where smallmouth bass were stocked, living side by side, they can grow to over 10 years Mm -hmm. old. Okay. I mean, that's a very, very different life very history, yeah. right? So they have a lot more to do yep. in a shorter period of time, yeah. right? It showcases that Neosho bass are, are not a smallmouth. Yeah. They are different. They truly are different. That's right. Gotcha. So you've got these places then where we've, like you said, introduced impoundments historically. We've then had smallmouth stocked in places that would have been native Neosho range. And that's where we get these hybridizations, these streams where we have two different fish existing, coexisting, but also hybridizing. Mm-hmm. So what is the current trajectory for the Neosho bass in its native range? Are we going to be able to sustain the Neosho or at some point will all of these fish just hybridize to the point that there's there's no uniqueness? So, so one thing that's, you know, we've kind of already talked about is wherever we've built dams and and build these big lakes impoundments like Lake Tenkiller, Neosho bass did not support a fishery. They apparently need flowing water. Mm-hmm. That's, you know, something we still kind of need to understand more about, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, but we've come back and we've said, well, we still want to catch smallmouth, so we're going to stock smallmouth from Tennessee. In those systems, those smallmouth, and as you know, if you fish for smallmouth in Tennessee— yeah, they live in the lakes, but yeah, they also live in most of the rivers and streams, you know. Um, so there don't that there's no imaginary boundary for them. Like, yeah, they're gonna take hold in the lake, they're gonna do really well in the lake, but yeah, they're also gonna go into the same streams, the streams that are still strongholds for Neosho. Mm-hmm. Um, in the Illinois River, which is the main tributary that flows into Lake Ten Killer, mm-hmm. we have basically seen from presumably what would have been a hundred percent of the individuals being Neosho historically mm-hmm. before the stocking happened, we now have like, you know, way less than half are Neosho, pure mm-hmm. Neosho. Mm-hmm. When we go back and sample there. Yeah. Lots of hybrids. And we're not just talking about like 50-50 hybrids. 
we're talking about those 50-50 hybrids, like when a Neo Show and a Smallmouth first got together. We call that an F1. It's first filial generation. Okay. It's like like when you're, you know, like when my mom and dad got together, I'm their F1. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so you have those, but then those F1s then go back and mate in any direction, sometimes with another F1, sometimes with a pure of either side. Mm -hmm. You get all these weird crisscrosses of like 25, 75, and all kinds of weird permutations. You don't even really know what you're dealing with because looks don't even follow this anymore. Right. You just have like essentially like um, in more impaired systems I've worked like in the Chattahoochee River in Georgia, we, you basically get to a point where it's kind of a, it's kind of a term I don't like to use, and I don't use it lightly. But I, I call them mutt bass. Mm. They're they're a bass. Yeah. They have some history of hybridization, but you don't even know what they are anymore. Right. They're they're uh, sometimes we just call them river fish. Yeah. They're just they're something. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Um. And and so that's kind of the danger of moving fish around. Yeah. And uh, I know there's there's lots of people out there on social media doing podcasts that talk about don't move fish around. Mm -hmm. But I don't think a lot of people have seen this play out in real time like like we have where you where you have the complete replacement of a native fish population. Yeah. with something that's been moved in in a decade or two. Yeah. So basically what you just said is in a place where you had a presumably 100% of the species in that river is now 50% or, or less or less than 50% yeah. neo show. Yeah. And so there is a real threat in certain places yeah where you will no longer have just a pure a pure endemic species it will be some hybrid of the cross between a smallmouth and a neo show. Right. Is that a real threat? It is. So I think, you know, we think about that, you use that term endemic. Mm -hmm. So endemic means you're only native to a small area. Mm -hmm. Anytime you have a critter that's endemic, just inherently because it's in a small area, it's kind of at more inherent risk, right? One or two populations can really matter to keeping that species around. So in the case of the Illinois River, that was one of the biggest river systems in the native range of the Neosho. And we're seeing it, uh, you know, in our time, like in the last two decades, mm -hmm. go from almost all Neosho to very rapidly diminishing to almost no Neosho mm -hmm. left. Um, that to me is really concerning. I think it would be concerning to anyone who knew about this critter and knew that it was different just because that's a big chunk of its range right there that we can basically say, I don't know that there's any way practically to get that ground back. Yeah. We've lost that ground. And the danger is people who do not know the ramifications of moving a fish like a non-native smallmouth into other lakes or into other streams, they may be like, oh, I have a stream in my backyard. I own a ranch. I own some property. I want to f fish for smallmouth. I don't know what's in my stream, but I'm going to pay somebody to come stock smallmouth in my stream. Yeah. That is local damage done, mm -hmm. right? And it can spread. Yeah. We've seen it spread on the landscape These way fish far move. upstream <laughs> and downstream. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, that permeates upstream and downstream of that introduction. Gotcha. And there's no artificial boundaries you can even have a farm pond mm -hmm. guess what that farm pond when it rains it's got a spillway somewhere yeah it'll and that flood. spillway goes to some tiny little creek that you don't maybe think nothing about yeah fish move yeah yeah gotcha. they always will <laughs> mm -hmm. um and so i think that's the big the biggest con like most immediate threat to the conservation of neosho is we have to get the word out to educate anglers of all these local endemic species and the value that they have, inherent value they have, mm -hmm. right? As part of our natural heritage, they're a cool thing to go experience. Yeah. See them in their habitat mm -hmm. where they've lived for millions of years. Right. And Long experience that. Because the places they live are beautiful mm -hmm. and they're all very unique. Mm -hmm. All these different bass live in very unique habitats that are each unique and beautiful in their own way. Yeah. I mean, that's the one thing we learned doing our endemic bass slam on this trip was yeah 
all the different habitats. Yeah. yeah. It's fabulous. Yeah, each river is beautiful. I'm you can pick traveled. out slightly different substrates, slightly different habitat. Mm -hmm. Fish are sitting in slightly different areas. I mean, it was fascinating to go and see that, like, as an angler, too. Yeah. You know. Dr. Long, being a guy who grew up in Springfield, you, you know, you've lived in the Ozarks mm -hmm. for a, a long period of your life. What would you hope to see come of, of the research that, that you guys have laid the groundwork for going forward? I mean, I conduct research to lead to better conservation outcomes and better management. So, I mean... Ideally, I want the work that I do to get used by management agencies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Dr. Taylor, for you, for someone who's hearing this for the first time, realizing the gravity of, wow, we have a unique species and, yeah. and also, unfortunately, add a threat to potentially one day being hybridized to the point of extirpation, or I don't even know if that would be the right word, but mm -hmm. yeah. what would be the call to action, if any? So I think, you know, if you look back in our history of just how we've treated wildlife all the way back from like early colonization, there were times when we almost lost white-tailed deer in the South, right? And now they're back, they're conserved, mm -hmm. stable. We would never think of that could yeah. ever happen. No, they're right? <laughs> But maybe we're at a time where the threats are high enough on some of these endemic black bass that we do stand to potentially lose them, mm -hmm. right? Completely off the map. And the risk is us as like people who like to go and hunt and fish that we've kind of taken for granted that that, that, that resource is always going to be there. So my call to action would be learn more about your local resource. Maybe it's your connection with the Ozarks. Maybe it's your connection with a very specific stream that you mm -hmm. like to go fish with your family. Mm -hmm. Learn about the critters that live there. They may only live there, mm. right? Yeah. And that can be a really, really important connection that you make that makes your, your outings to go enjoy nature more meaningful, but also it allows you to have a more informed voice and to maybe tell a neighbor that's thinking about moving fish around, which by the way is illegal, right? <laughs> Not to mention that. Um, <laughs> you may be able to save the Neosho bass. Yeah. You may be the person who, who mm. talks some sense into someone who's trying to move fish around because you know um, what unique critters live in your neck of the woods. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Some individual responsibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not exactly. just, hey, leave it exactly. to the agencies. Let them figure it out. Yeah. yeah. No, get, get because the agencies learn. will tell you once you move a fish, mm -hmm. all bets are off. It's almost yeah. impossible to I stop mean, it. I mean, it's almost, yeah, it is. It is practically impossible to stop yeah. um, these fish from invading once they're there. For part three of our series, we're going to be focusing in on the very place that could be considered the epicenter of change for the Neosho bass, the Illinois River. Once a place that would have been filled to the ecological brim with Neosho bass, over the last several decades has seen dramatic changes due to the introduction of an impoundment and the subsequent need for the stocking of non-native game fish that are better suited to the new environment. This need for new fish and the insatiable appetite of anglers to catch bigger fish has led to the permanent displacement of a fish that's naturally adapted to the free-running streams of the Western Ozarks. But as you might expect, this is not a straightforward story, and there are some nuances that we'll need to parse out with help from some friends in the Oklahoma Ozarks. We will see you on the next one.